Jesus has already done it. He's completed it. So the only game plan he's got right now is to get you to believe his lies. Yeah. That there's something that you're deficient in or insufficient about. It's all, it's, it's, all he has is a lie. Right? So I just believe that he still has breakthrough for us to come into this place where we realize and we, we appreciate what he wants to do in me and through me. What he wants to do in you and through you. All right? So this weekend, we went to Disneyland. So, yeah, Katie, yay! <laughs> I, I haven't been to Disneyland since I was a teenager, and I'm 48. So it's been many, many years. And Katie wanted to go for her birthday, and we put it, which was in the summer, and so we put it off till now because we wanted, she wanted to see the park with Christmas. Now, I, I've never studied Walt Disney. <laughs> But, you know, was it 50 some odd years ago he started the park, right? And his whole intention was to create what he called the happiest place on earth. Mm -hmm. and, and it really is interesting. I was just, I was chewing on that as I'm in the park. So when you go in, first off, you know, everybody felt, I, I felt like all the workers there were just like so excited that that's where they got to work. I mean, everybody, the bus, because I'm trying to engage in conversation with as many as I could, from the guy who was cleaning the bathroom, somebody who was picking up, you know, the little sweeping pans, and the, my bus driver that took us from the park. It's like, they were just thrilled that they got to work at Disney. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. The park truly is immaculate. It just looks, you know, if you were to describe it, you'd go, wow, it's perfect here. You don't see graffiti, you don't see trash. Everything's in order. As, as an engineer, I'm amazed at just the, um, the electronics and the audio. You go, wow, what a, what a feat that they've done. I mean, it really is um, pretty awesome when you walk this thing. Now, the kids that are going, they're going for this sense of make-believe, right? They're, the, yeah. they're going to walk into this place, and all those things that they saw in the Disney, this is true. Right? All the little cartoon characters are real. And so for them, it, it really is kind of a magical thing. that they're, And you can watch them. It's really fun to watch the kids. But you know what's just as fun to watch is the adults. And I'm not talking about parents. There were plenty of older people there that didn't have kids with them. And you thought, well, why are they here? Why are they here? It's like you, you really want to participate in this place that feels like there's just no problems. You come, you come into the park, and it's like, I just, I feel encouraged. I feel uh, joy. That, um, it's good to be around people that have a, just a sense of wanting to participate in that culture. And what are they doing? It's like, outside the park, it feels messy. <coughs> Inside, it just feels clean. Maybe I, I've met some who, who go because their lives feel so stressful that they just want to go and shut off just for a moment. Just kind of, right? They want to escape. Mm -hmm. It's like, just for a moment. I just, because life just feels cluttered. And I thought, wow, look at that. And, and the other observation I had was, um, I felt people, when they came in the park, not just the employees, but the guests participated in the culture. Nobody tells the guests, hey, pick up your trash. But you don't see people dumping trash. You really don't. It's like they're not marring things. Or it's like, well, they came into this place, and all of a sudden, there's, there's this attraction that they have to want to participate in it and protect it even. They're, they're, you would have conversations with people online, and you really felt like, well, oh, we could be friends. We could hang out for, with each other. Let's go get some coffee. It's just, it really was an enjoyable experience. Is it fake? No, I mean, it's got lots of things and props around it, but it's, it really is a genuine culture. And I thought, God, that was your plan. Walt, Walt Disney had nothing on you. You, you. you said you came to bring order. You came to clean up the mess, <laughs> right? Those, all those anxieties you have, he says, I want to take those away. All those thoughts spinning in your head, God says, I want to bring peace to that. The, the sickness, he says, I don't, I don't have a place with sickness. Pain, come on, build your list. 
And, and you, you find out really quick, his kingdom really is genuinely the happiest place on earth. It's purely a lie from the enemy that tries to get you to believe that that can't exist. Right? When in, in, in Matthew 5, when he's, this, uh, see, I'm going to get way off because it's not my thing. But in Matthew 5, when he's talking on the Sermon on the Mount, when he talks about blessed is he, and he gives his, you know, that word is happy. Happy is the man, happy is the woman, that. And he gives, this lays out his kingdom culture. Right? It's, it's the kingdom manifesto. And he says, so everything in the kingdom was designed to create the happiest place on earth. And you go, well, I, I, uh, I'm not experiencing that. <laughs> it's, so you have to ask yourself, wait a second. Who's in my space then? Right? Because the Lord says where he is, that stuff can't coexist. Right? Perfect love casts out fear. Thanks, Sherry. That was in 1 John 4, 18 this morning. She just <laughs> sends me a card. Perfect love casts out fear. So where he's at, this stuff can't coexist. So it's like John's word even this morning. Hey, what are those things in your space? Because I didn't put it there. So get rid of it. That's what he was talking about. Let's get rid of those things. So happiness, the happiest place on earth, can exist right where you stand because he's there. His presence is there. So I think, God, you're showing me these things. God, help me learn them. So he gives us this assignment. He says, go. He tells us to go and do all these amazing things. That place that you've experienced, that happiness, right there, he says, now go bring that to that place. To that, bring that encounter over to there, to that person, to that situation that needs a shift in their atmosphere. Right? And this is where we go, yeah, but, right? We, we start to question, really? Is that me? me? Now, we look at, we've been going after this, Jesus established a model for how we should, how we live life in this kingdom culture, right? He established, he, he came to show us how to live in a right relationship with the Father. He came to show us how a man filled with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, lived life, right? He wasn't exempt from problems around him, right? He came to show us how to live in the midst of those things, how to shift the atmosphere where we're at. And so we would say, well, okay, that's God. That's Jesus, the Son of God. I'm not Jesus. And, right, that's, so we, we stop right there. I'm not Jesus. And we go, well, hold on a second. Let's talk about the disciples, right? And we look at them and we say, well, when they were with him, they had a, they had a measure of what you might call success in kingdom living. But even they came back, though, and said, Jesus why did it happen here, but it didn't happen here? How come I could, you, I could cast them out in this city and this city, right? So they're learning. But w so what have, what have we talked about? We've also learned that, well, they kind of had a partial place of authority there. But Jesus, one, had not gone to the cross yet. And two, the Holy Spirit had not been released on them. That's what we found in Acts, where God says, wait here. I'm going to give you everything you need to complete that assignment. Right? That's what we discovered in Acts. He came. So he did. He's living inside. Everything I need to do my job of when he said go, my commission, I have. So I'm still in this place of, yeah, but. That's the breakthrough I think he's, he has for us, church. It's like, how do I get past the yeah, but? How do I get through that door that says, somehow I'm not qualified to be the happiest place on earth? I'm not qualified to exist or stand in that place. Right, so there's there's something to be said about encounter, commission, power, and authority. Right, we, the church loves encounters. When I say that, it's like I love to come to this place where they're worshiping. There's a sense of like he's here, he's in this place. Right, but what do I do with that? Right, do I sit? Was it all about? Oh, okay, I feel good now. I can go. Then I go and I have a trashy week and I, it just feels generally yucky. And then I come back, okay, I need my encounter again. <sighs> I, feel, I feel good. Now I can go, right? Look, your encounters with the Lord and even times like this where we come together, they are intended to do that. They are. It's here for you to be refreshed. He, he wants that. It's here to restore you. 
right? There's a sense of, like, even, right, re renewing those things that feel like maybe they've been kind of chipped away at or even robbed this week. It's intentional. But the Father also says, now in that place of feeling refreshed, he's reminding you of your commission. Hey, how, how you doing on your, on your job? How you, how you doing on, on our relationship, working together? How you doing living kingdom today? How you, how you doing? And that's the conversation we shy away from. Right? Where it's like, well, Father, I, we, we love to bring him our list. God, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. I need you to fix this. I need you to provide this. I've got my list. I need you, God. Mm -mm. He wants to know, it's like, well, what about my list sometimes? He's got things he would love to share with you, but we get stuck in this place, right, that says, I came for the encounter, right, and that's all I want, right? And I, and I, I just want you to know, that's the biggest lie, I think, right there from the enemy, that you weren't created to live past the encounter, he wants you to be in this place where you feel comfortable, like sitting on the couch next to him. I mean, can you actually even kind of visualize that we would sit on the couch with the father and he says, man, how was your day? And you feel it and you're feeling that oh, I'm okay. He's taking, he's taking the junk away. And then he starts talking to you. Hey, what do you want to go do? Let's go. Let's go change up. Let's go change this. So that's that place we want, we want to live in. Now, it's funny because when Lance read Romans 8.28, earlier this week he'd given a post, and this isn't my notes either, <clears throat> so I'll probably, I'll probably do that too, don't I? <clears throat> <laughs> right? Romans, listen to this, Romans 8.28. Um, actually, and I'm reading out of the message because I really liked when Lance used it in the post. He, I, I won't read 28, that's what he read about um, God working out something good. But re listen in verse 29. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. Did you hear that? Amen. He's shaping you just along the same form and fashion as Jesus. The son stands first in the line of <clears throat> humanity he restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then, after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end. That's the Holy Spirit. Gloriously completing what he had begun. Look, so we're going to, that issue settled. He you're his plan A, the Holy Spirit in you. So I want to talk this morning about that threshold of going from this encounter to walking in this commission, about intentionally releasing, understanding that I have an assignment to release his presence. He's in me, yes. He's also upon me to give, right? It, it models the same teaching we had probably a couple months back when we talked about faith and love. That vertical relationship, I, I rest in the vertical, right? My faith, confident of who he is and what he's done and what he's resourced me to go do, which is love, right? So church, that's how he wants us to live, right? So it's really interesting. So as you go read in, the, in each of these commissionings where he says, go heal the sick, right? And, and, and preach the gospel, right? And open blind eyes, raise the dead. There's an interesting statement he says and, and I'll read the, there's one in Matthew and one in Luke but, and you don't have to turn there but after he gives this go preach this message about the kingdom he tells them in whatever town or village you enter search for some worthy, per, worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave as you enter the home give it your greeting if the home is deserving <coughs> let your peace rest on it if it is not let your peace return to you I thought, well, that's kind of peculiar. When you go to the house, you're, it's like, how do you give peace? How do you, how do you send this <coughs> out and actually say, well, I didn't want it, so I'm taking it back? What is that? So 
I want to draw you to this picture. Back in Genesis, we looked at a, we looked at one. Remember Jacob and the, with a ladder from heaven, and we talked about what that prophetic picture looked like. Remember this one in the ark, right, with Noah, and so he's he's got a window that's high in the ark, so he can't see his surroundings, right? He doesn't. He knows he's been a, he's been in the storm floating for many days. He doesn't know what the environment's like out there. So what does he do? Right? Remember the dove? Remember he sends out the dove. And sometime later, the dove comes back. Right? And so Noah, Noah realized there was no place for the dove to go. Right? So it says he took the dove back to himself. Does it again. This time it comes back with a branch, an olive branch. And then he waits another week, and then he sends it out again a third time, and what? It doesn't come back, right? Because it found a place to rest. In the kingdom, peace, let me do it this way. In the world, peace is about the absence of something, right? The absence of war, the absence of conflict. Maybe it's the absence of noise, Right? But in the kingdom, peace is not the absence of something. In the kingdom, peace is a person. Peace is Jesus, the Spirit of God. Right? So how do, now, how do I give that on a house? How do I give that in an environment? Okay? So listen to what Jesus says about himself. In John chapter 6, he says, because we want to tell how do I release this? How do I release his spirit on a situation? He says, it is the spirit who gives life. And I'm reading in John 6, 60. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So Jesus, right? Jesus Christ let me go to John 1, just to remove any doubt. Jesus Christ is the Word. Right? In fact, earlier in the chapter it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? He was in the beginning with God. You go line later, probably verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ is the Word, right? And it says, and when He speaks, His Spirit becomes life, right? When His when Jesus releases this Word, right, He He's releasing kingdom. Do you see that? So here's here's what I want you to know. All when when all ministry, I'm thinking about that dove again. When he speaks, I want you to get this picture. Maybe this will help. When he speaks, I want you to think of him sending out the dove. Right? Just like Noah. Right? So all ministry, really, I don't care how you, where you're at, what church you're in, all ministry is about your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And where, and where is that Holy Spirit resting? All ministry. So... Are we positioning ourselves to be a person, a man or a woman, who is releasing right, the spirit in the environment? So, Romans says, Romans 14, 17, says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy, <clears throat> is that peace, and what? In the Holy Spirit, right? So the kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. So let's stitch it all together. Jesus speaks. It says he speaks life. His words become spirit. The spirit is the kingdom, right? <clears throat> the spirit's the kingdom. So when he speaks, he is releasing kingdom in the atmosphere. He says this, a greater reality just came upon this one, right? So that's, what, that's the model Jesus is showing us. So what are some ways that we can intentionally release his spirit, right? So there's the first one right there. We need to be about declaring his words. Jesus said he only spoke 
what the father was saying. He only did what the father was doing. So we have to realize this, this place. We find out in the Gospels when we're reading his story, Jesus continually stole away and, and, and got away on his own. Do you wonder what was he doing there in those quiet places? You think maybe, well, is he, he must be needing a nap. <laughs> I'll tell you what he's doing. He's spending time with the Father. Right? He is, he, is, he, is, he is realized and he's showing us the model that that intimate place with the Father is so critical. How did he know what the Father was doing? How did he know what the Father was saying? What he wanted to say, he had to spend time with the Father. Oh, church. Amen. I don't know what that looks like for you. But I would just like to encourage you. You're not, his words, what the Father is saying, you're not going to find on the internet. You're not going to find trolling around on the TV, at the movie theater, with your friends. It's an intimate relationship between you and the Father. That you would, that you would genuinely come to the place where you're comfortable saying, I don't, I don't, what's this? Ask questions. Can you show me this? What does this mean? Where you're reading in scripture and it's, you're confused and, and he's the one you go to to say, this doesn't make any sense to me. But the issue of understanding what he's saying is so important. So I want to, I just want to encourage you that maybe this week, that's a good place to start. You're sitting here saying, I want to be an environment changer. I want to, I want to be able to release this happiest place on earth around me to my coworkers or to somebody that needs Jesus, it, can, it starts right there. That's an easy one of intentionally releasing. What does the Father say about this? <clears throat> You'll hear us talking up here many times and releasing blessings over you or speaking a declaration. This is what he says. I'm declaring, right? All we're doing is we're agreeing with what he has already said, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the ways that we release presence is just coming into agreement with his word and speaking it. Right? And speaking his words. So I just want to encourage you, be about this business of what is the Father saying? Here's one way to find it. The other one is to crawl into his lap and ask him, what does he want to do? Another way that we release presence is through touch. Right? The right Bible makes it clear. We have this privilege to lay hands on people and release presence. We can, we can pray for healing. Right? He says, lay hands on the sick. On the sick. He says that we can impart by commissions, right? He tells us to lay hands on them and send them out, right? So there is, there is something that's going from us to him. We're just following his model. Other ways that we can release presence, right, is through acts of faith. You know, sometimes when we'll pray, or maybe you're the one being prayed for, right? Maybe it's a bad shoulder. You know, one, one thing you can do is just like, you know what? I'm, don't, I'm not telling you to hurt yourself, Right? Don't. If the doctor said don't walk on it, don't walk on it. But you know where when you have pain in your body. So if someone's praying for, say, a bad shoulder, test it out. Hey, right? Test it out and find out. Hey, did God just? Did you do something? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna come into agreement with what just you said over me. God heals, right? And I'm gonna test it out. Maybe you're praying for somebody. Ask them. Test it out. We have many. We have much evidence in Scripture where God used the act of faith to bring. His presence to complete a situation, right? So let's walk in those things. Right? Other ones are prophetic acts. Like, remember the guy that he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash? And when you wash, what happened after he did that? His eyes were open. Was there magic in the water? No, right? But God, God uses these things. Are we faithful to step and come into agreement with what he's saying to us and believe, God, you're, you're doing something here. Right? So acts of faith, prophetic acts, touch, and declaring words are ways that we can intentionally release presence. Right? All, we're just saying, God, you created me to be a man who walks in risk and comes into an environment that needs you. And I say, I, you have everything I need to shift this environment. Amen. Come on, we can do that. I didn't say, wow, wow, wow. We could do that. <laughs> what, about, what about unintentional ways? Do you remember the one of the woman with the issue of blood? Yeah. 
right? And so she's exhausted her resources, right, to, because there's something going on in her body. She's been to, we, we take it to understand she's tried everything, doctors and medicines and whatever else, and nothing's working. And so it tells us in his word that, that there's crowds of people that are coming around Jesus, right? This, it says throngs is the word. You get the picture, right? Don't you? It's like Disneyland Friday night, huh? Throngs of people. <laughs> you got to see Evan and Heather there. That was kind of cool. So throngs of people, right? And the woman, right, makes her way through the crowd and just touches his clothes. Do you... Did, did, did I miss it, or did, what was that sermon of Jesus that just says, touch my clothes and you'll be healed? It's not there, isn't it? No. So you have to ask yourself, what was she thinking? What was she thinking? Right? That just touching his clothes, he didn't lay hands on her, he didn't speak anything over her, there was no prophetic act, right? He didn't look at her, and, right? She didn't grab him and get his attention, she touched his clothes. And when she did that, Jesus recognized right then. He says, hey, what happened? I felt power leave me. I always thought that. And, and what of the disciples? you got to be kidding me, right? Yeah. This big old crowd. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you felt something leave you? Mm -hmm. right? Actually, rabbit shall bring me back if I forget. So I'm looking at this. I'm looking at Lance to help like, keep me on track. But <clears throat> reading that 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 piece of the scripture when the woman's healed. It says that Jesus said virtue left him. Virtue left him. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? Right? This, is a, this would be a long rabbit trail, so I won't get into it. But always, when I hear the word virtue, right, I generally, for me, I think of a behavior. Right? I'm thinking of, like, good behavior. In fact, when you go read... Um, in 2 Peter, right, he says, add to your faith. In most translations, it says moral excellence, and moral excellence, knowledge, and then knowledge, and that progression all the way down to love. It's like, add to your faith all being good. Do you know that that word for virtue, literally, when Jesus says virtue left me, was a Greek word for power? It, 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 it had this essence of this supernatural goodness of God, right, coming out, leaving, and, and impacting his environment, supernatural, right? This, this, we're talking about divine goodness coming and creating an impact. So when he said, that left me, that's what he's talking about, his <clears throat> favor and goodness, right? Think about this, however you want to describe this character and essence of heaven, Right? Being released on this sickness. Virtue. Power. So now when I read that, now I can't help it when I read that second Peter. Add to your faith power. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Add to your faith, right? This recognition that I the, the substance of him, his presence in me, he's given me authority to release and give and bring an impact and environment. Add to your faith that, right? It's, that, it's getting past that, that door, that threshold of, I've got the encounter, I feel good, but I'm gonna <coughs> feel, uh, there's something keeping me from walking. That's this virtue. He says, walk in that. It's like, oh, wow, that is the coolest thing. So it's like, so Jesus, he, right, it says they, she touched it and she was healed. You go just a few chapters later. Now we read. Oh, let me read what I'm doing. And I'm like so like all over the place now. So I hope it's like coming through. Right. So in Mark, right. So this event happened. You still haven't heard Jesus say, "Touch my clothes and you'll be healed." Right. Right. We don't know why the woman did it, other than it's like this absolute hunger for His presence. Right. You. I need you to change this situation in my life. I'm hungry for that. Just, it's like, that's what I'm going after. Just so happens it was his garment. And Mark, it says, and wherever he went, in the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his garment. 
<laughs> and all who touched him were healed. How did that happen? See, right? It went from somebody who's just exploring. I have no idea if this is going to do anything. But God, I'm so desperate for you. It's like, and you know her story did what? She got healed and went, and they went, what happened? Just, just, just mm -hmm. coming in, into his co contact with his presence, she's healed. So you can see this right in the countryside. What? He heals just that right there? So thick, right? So thick with this, yes, Jesus filled in the Holy Spirit, but also aware of this presence upon him, that that's what he brings. So aware of it. That's how he knew something left, because he's constantly aware of the Holy Spirit. Like, man, that is good. It's like, okay, well, that's Jesus, right? Well, hold on. Here's one for you. Remember this one with Paul in, in Acts? It says, in Acts 19, it says he was doing um, extraordinary miracles. <coughs> now, isn't that kind of goofy right there? Isn't miracle in itself like, like, whoa, bizarre, like un unbelievable? What's an extraordinary miracle? Come on. That is like, that doesn't, does it? so it had to be like, okay, this is weird. I don't get it. You know what it says they were doing for Paul? It says they were taking his apron, right? He's a, Paul was a, a worker. He's built, he's making tents, right? He's doing his job. Still, in this place, in this relationship with the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, then you know what Paul's thinking about the extraordinary miracles? It's like, really? That worked? that healed somebody? You took... It's like, they judged you. So I want you to see that. Even for... This isn't Jesus. This is Paul. You want another unintentional, really crazy one? How about Peter? Where it says, they took the sick... And line them up in the street. So what? So even his, even his shadow? Who came up with that? Even his shadow coming right, touching shadow passing over the people. They're healed. Right? And here's where the church goes. Okay, wait, 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 wait. We need some theology lessons. Let's get some like. Let's get some boundaries on God here for a second. God does this, doesn't do this. Be careful about that. That's crazy talk right there. It's like, look, I think we have yet to explore the creativity of heaven. When God says, be like children before me, that's what he's talking about. You know what I remember at Christmas time when I was a little kid? begging for an empty wrapping paper tube because it became a sword, right? It became a sword and the newspaper got turned into a pirate hat for me. It's like, who said, who said that wrapping paper tubes could be swords? It's clearly not metal and you don't have a handle, all right? Goofy thinking, I know, but it's like, can, I think the Holy Spirit wants us to be adventurous with him. Yeah. Right? Am I looking for a church to define the parameters of my relationship with the Father? Am I looking for a church to put kingdom in a box so tight that, well, I'm uncomfortable with this shadow thing. I'm uncomfortable with what's this, you know, hankies and, and, and aprons and presents and that doesn't, you know, it's like, all I want to tell you is, would you be childlike before the Father and if, he, if you're spending time with him and he says, hey, go do this, that you would risk it and go do it. That you're not so bound up by religion or a denomination or some kind of structure that says, you can't do that. And you go, well, who says? Right? His, I think his presence just, he wants to explore his kids and play with his kids. Look, I don't know where that takes you. I don't want to build a theology about hankies. Or, 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 or paper tubes even, right? I'm, it's like, I don't wanna, I'm not here to do that. I'm just saying, he's asked us to have childlike hearts. Let me, let me share a story with you. So I went up to, um, to see my, some of our kids and my son who was in ministry school up at Bethel. And so there's, we crashed one of their courses. So there's a, one day a week, or maybe it's more, but the day we were there, they have a general session. So there's a thousand students, right, in, this, in the convention center. And so we're there, 
just participating in school, a lecture. And this guy is up on the stage, and he is giving a lesson on the theology of joy. Right? This isn't church. This is class. This is school. So they're instructing them. They're going through scripture. And what does scripture show us? And, right? And I'm, I'm listening to his, his sermon, and I'm, I'm thinking, this is boring. Right? But again, I have to remind myself, it's not church. This is school. These are students. They're here to learn. But I'm thinking, this is just like, oh, this is like monotone and oh, kind of Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. It's like, wow. Oh. And, and so I'm not really getting into this lecture. Right? Joy. Lecture on joy. And, and as, as I'm sitting here, and I'm kind of, I'm in the back. They have a section for visitors. And so I'm on this second level looking on this sea of students, right? And they're talking about joy. And right down the, the middle, you see this person get up and they start walking up like this. They walk right to the, right up to the podium, clear as me, because everybody's taking notes and got their computers out and such. And, and the person takes off, I think it was like a scarf or something. And he's up here talking and just sit, Sets it on the stage and goes back to his seat. I'm thinking, that's weird. That's weird. Right? Boring lecture. He keeps talking. A little while later, somebody else comes up, puts a hat on the stage. I'm thinking, what are they doing? A little while later, somebody comes up, and they're just, they're coming. And this is a big thousand people, right? Comes up. Somebody takes their shoes off, puts them on. The and, but now I'm like, okay, this is, this is kind of goofy, real crazy, right? And, and so in my head, I'm thinking, there's a rule book somewhere. That's not in the rule book. I don't know what you think you're doing, but that's weird, right? And so I, <laughs> I lean over to my son. Or maybe it was Jessica. I think it was sitting with Jessica at the time. I said, what are they doing? And she says, they want that. Yes. They want that in their life. They're so hungry for it. They're, they want that. Yes. I thought, oh, okay. So my my little kind of nervous tension about disorder kind of quiets a little bit as more people are coming up and doing this. And now, mm -hmm. some are coming up, and it's cement floors. This isn't a church. This is a, this is a big civic... Cement floors, laying on the floors. And he's not even breaking stride. Theology of joy. Right? I'm thinking, this is... Why? Now over here on the side, there's this young person probably, you know... My son's age, 20s. There's another lady, they're probably my generation. And they're over it, and you can see them just kind of like getting excited about what God... This is a lecture. Theology of joy. <laughs> and they're over here getting excited. Meanwhile, there's more people piling up and thinking, what is going on? Oh, yeah. This is a lecture, right? We're, we're 30 minutes into this lecture, and now there are bodies everywhere. They're not slain in the spirit. It's just like God... If you're speaking, if you're releasing joy, I want that. I'm so hungry. I want that in my life, right? So now there are bodies everywhere, and now people are on their feet, and you see them going, come. It's like they're hungry, and now I find myself, I'm on my feet going, come on, come on. It's like, I need this. I want this. And so now you've got a 1,000 people on their feet. There's not an instrument in the room. Nobody's playing. And he's up there, theology of joy. <laughs> Thinking, what? And so finally, as you get all this people, this hunger, this, this just people coming together in agreement, he says, you know what? It's time. Let's just kind of release some of this. And he steps down and begins to minister to people. And I looked at Justin and I said, you got to be kidding me. Is that, is it like this wow. all the time? He said, all the time, Dad. Wow. All the time. <laughs> Can I have a worship team come on up? Awesome. I, 